Being an academic, I have to tell you a little bit of um, why I study villages and why I study um, uh, dissolutions. Because villages in New York are really pretty unique in that they are a unit of general government that can create themselves and dissolve themselves. And so more than any other type of government in the state of New York, they are self-governing. Uh, and I think that's an important uh, thing to know because in, if, you're, if you want to become a city, you have to get permission from the state government in the form of a charter approval in order to become a city. Um, towns are the kind of the default. If you're not a city, you're not a village, you're in a town. Um, villages are formed from towns and they dissolve back into towns. Uh, there are over 550 villages in the state of New York right now, give or take a few. Um, and back in 2010, the uh, state passed the New York Government Reorganization and Citizen Power Empowerment Act. And what that does is it, it changed the dissolution process, uh, and I wanted to just go through that a little bit so that people can understand a little bit of how it works. <coughs> now, consolidation, we'll hear some discussion about consolidation. And that requires the approval of the voters in both jurisdictions that are being dissolved or being uh, consolidated. So, for example, if um, if the town of Vestal wanted to become one government with the city of Binghamton, then the residents of Vestal and the residents of Binghamton would have to vote, uh, and both of those jurisdictions would have to have a majority vote <coughs> approving this, uh, the the dis. Um, the consolidation. Now, in contrast, dissolution requires the approval of the voters only of the unit being dissolved. So villages always dissolve into the towns from which they came. And a village dissolution vote had the, the town residents outside of the village have no say if the village um, <coughs> dissolves or not. And so the town residents will be very interested in what happens when a village considers a dissolution, but they don't have any vote uh, in the matter uh, that proceeds. Now there are two different routes that the law sets out for, um, for dissolution. And the first route can be um, taken by the governing board. So in this case, a village board could pass a resolution and um, the, the village board, with the resolution would say, we uh, resolve to uh, put a uh, referendum for village dissolution on the ballot. And then the board prepares a plan. Um, and the plan requires looking at all of the services, all of the um, assets of the village, all the debt of the village, everything related to the village, and um, and determines if the village dissolves, what happens to all of these uh, uh, goods and services. Then um, public hearings are held, and after the public hearings are held, there's a, a referendum, a vote, and that can either take place as a special <coughs> referendum, or it can take place as a um, part of a, a general municipal election. And if a majority of the residents of the village support dissolution, um, then the village ceases to exist as an entity. Uh, the, uh, and that means the assets of the village go into the town, um, the employees of the village may or may not um, be, uh, be hired by the town, the services that the village provides may or may not be provided by the town. Um, all of that's laid out in the plan, um, but it's up to the town board then to determine how much of the plan will be followed. So the second way that a uh, dissolution can take place is that citizens themselves can initiate a petition drive. And what happens there is if 10% of the registered voters in the village sign a petition, um, then, the, uh, uh, then a referendum vote is required to be held. <clears throat> okay, so, um, 10% vote is a, or 10% petition is a pretty low threshold. If you have 500 residents in the village, registered voters in the village, that's 50, 50 signatures. 
Um, and then, if the referendum vote passes, then the um, village board uh, and the town board has to have a plan prepared, and that plan then uh, also has public hearings. But here's the difference. After the hearings, the consolidation plan is going to take place. Unless 25% of the eligible voters say, wait a second, we want a second vote on the planned um, dissolution. <clears throat> and so then a second referendum would be held, and a majority of the voters would have to pass the, the planned dissolution. So in a sense, there's kind of like the first vote is um, we think there ought to be a dissolution, um, and that launches the development of the plan and the public hearings, but then the plan will be implemented unless there's a second petition drive and a second vote saying, we, we changed our mind, we've looked at the plan, we don't want to do that. So in that case, if it's a citizen-initiated referendum, the default will be that there will be a dissolution unless they have, unless the citizens launch a second drive and have a second dissolution vote. Okay. So one of the things to keep in mind is that a citizen-initiated referendum vote um, really kind of sets the ball rolling for a dissolution um, unless they turn around later and, and change their mind. Okay. Now, there are a couple of really critical questions um, that a dissolution plan has to consider. Uh, and the first one is, how many savings can be expected? And one of the things that happens uh, a lot of times in dissolutions is uh, residents in a village know that, they're, that they pay property taxes and that um, goes to both the, the town and, and the village. And so they, they have this thought in mind that they will save a lot of money if they dissolve the village. But usually, village taxes are a fraction of the taxes that the property taxes that any resident is paid. So, um, you know, the bulk of your property taxes go to your school district, another good chunk of your property taxes go to your county, um, and so even with the dissolution of the village, your overall property tax bill may not decline that much. Um, and a lot depends then on what kinds of services you want to continue and how you want to continue those. Um, a few years ago, I was part of the uh, Dissolution Study uh, Committee um, when the village of Johnson City was considering a dissolution. And one of the uh, things that that committee set out to do was to try and maintain the same types and levels of services for the village after dissolution as before the dissolution. So Johnson City has a paid police department, so there was um, discussion about how to maintain police services. Um, Johnson City has a paid fire department, and so there was there were issues about um, how the fire department, how the fire services would be provided. Um, and so the plan that uh, that was produced did have um, changes and cuts in those services, but there wasn't a total elimination of those. Um, for example, the um, uh, police services that are provided in the town union that the village would have dissolved into um, are provided by the county sheriff's department and the um, state police department. If the village of Johnson City had dissolved, there was an agreement to have the uh, sheriff's department increase its patrols and staffing in the village, but it wouldn't have been at the same level that the, uh, uh, the village had prior to that dissolution vote. And those kinds of issues get to be really emotional. Um, and, um, you know, that's one of the things that I would, I would caution uh, anyone who's considering one of these processes, is that uh, it often sets neighbors against neighbors in ways that um, can, can really um, cause long-lasting hard feelings. Um, and the votes are often close. 
um, and, uh, and those take some time to, to recover from in, in the community. So in order to address that as you go into a process, I think everyone involved needs to act in good faith and say we just want to get the facts, we want to, we want to make the best plan we can, we want to be as open and transparent about the process as we can be, um, we want to get a lot of input from people about what the mix of, of services will be afterwards. There needs to be a lot of discussion between the town and the village and a lot of confidence that the town will implement the plan that the village puts together. Um, and then the, uh, the outcome hopefully would be something that the majority of the residents of the community can feel comfortable with. Um, so that, I think, with, with that I'll stop because I want to leave time for questions and also for the other panelists. Uh, but again, let me just thank you all for uh, taking the time to be here tonight and to, uh, to, to listen to the discussion. And uh, I hope that uh, it will be useful for you. Just jump in? Yeah. privilege to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Diana Smith. I'm former village mayor from Santa Falls. And with me is Connie Sowers, the former village administrator. Um, we were invited to, to come and participate in the panel because Santa Falls is, um, to our knowledge, the largest village um, to dissolve in the state of New York. Um, and uh, that dissolution took place uh, uh, was effective as of uh, December 31st, uh, 2011. So we are now, uh, you know, uh, 11 months into uh, the newly dissolved, uh, um, the new new government, uh, uh, the town of Seneca Falls, newly uh, formed government. So um, without further ado, we brought some uh, uh, slides to share. Let me just see if this is going to work. So far, so good. Um, so, Connie and I have traveled around the state, and we've given many presentations um, to uh, NICOM, the Conference of Mayors, to uh, the Association of Towns, to the Clerks Association, Rural Waters, um, and a lot of other associations, talking about the dissolution process, talking about um, what, what we feel are the lessons that can be learned from the process that we went through. Um, those impacts. Um, we certainly have a lot to say about dissolution, and while we're not anti-dissolution uh, in any way, when we feel that in, in, in some areas, in some communities, it may make perfect sense, um, but we, we maintain a certain um, uh, uh, emphatic insistence that local governments are uh, tremendously valuable and that uh, there's a certain passion that we have about local government. And we feel that way, and, and, and I, I can, with some confidence, speak for Connie at this point, because local government is the closest to the people. And by virtue of that, local government tends to be more accountable. And if, in fact, uh, this interest in dissolution is in the name of uh, uh, creating opportunities for efficiency, we happen to believe that most often local government is the most efficient form of government. People are participating, are uh, asking questions, um, and there's more transparency. So we have found that, um, um, you know, in most cases, it is the most efficient form of government. So we just happen to think that there's a problematic disconnect between um, what defines quality of life in a community and um, the government services that uh, are related to that quality of life, the, the services that people receive, and a disconnect between that and taxes and a perception of what government is. Um, and who's to blame, really, at the end of the year when um, there's less money in the bank account? So, um, so anyway, all of that aside, we have some pretty strong feelings about all of that. But tonight we were asked to come and present on a, um, a very focused um, subject, and that is um, we were asked to comment specifically on the issues we faced during the transition period between the adoption of the plan and the vote in our community and 
the date that we actually closed the doors and turned out the lights for the last time. So um, tonight's focus is really on the difference between planning in our community and implementation. And our contention that they're not the same and that one doesn't necessarily guarantee the other. And actually, Dr. Sinclair alluded to that just a few minutes ago, so we'll, uh, we'll, talk, uh, we'll talk more about that. So the village of Seneca Falls was under the old dissolution law. Uh, Dr. Sinclair talked about 17A, the new law. Um, the plan came first. You were required to have a plan in place before the vote. When the vote happened, the vote was final. It isn't like the process now. Um, it was done, it was done, and the minute that vote was taken and there was no recourse and the clock started ticking. Uh, March 16th, 2010 at 9 p.m., not that we were counting or know exactly the minute it happened, um, we knew that was the step and then the next step was to close the doors as of midnight of the next year. It was actually specified in the statute that you would close the subsequent year, December 31st, for us it was 2011. Um, municipalities are long-term enemies with what, in most cases, are never-ending cycles of operations, of payments, um, of bonds and debts <coughs> and receipts, payments that come and are made um, retrospectively for the, for the prior year, Payments that are um, that, that come and are made prospectively because they're for the, the coming year. Um, like people, municipalities tend to plan for um, a very long future within which time they can they can pay for things, they can settle up and then document properly. Um, so imagine even on a personal level being told that you have a very limited amount of time to close out, finalize everything. Uh, everything you've got coming to you, uh, take care of every debt and obligation, pay off your mortgage, for instance, but have it done by the end of the year. And that'll kind of give you an idea of what we were faced with um, when the uh, decision was made. So, when the vote took place, I think um, the community's perception was that the plan was in place, and uh, that plan was a realistic picture of our future, so, hey, the path is set and clear, so just to <coughs> see. When, in fact, um, there are areas of the plan, uh, areas of focus that um, were included in the final document that was the plan, um, you have to remember that the plan was devised by a committee um, within a finite amount of time. Um, my favorite commentary on that subject came from Father Granke um, for, during his uh, St. Anthony's Mass opener, the uh, first time I wanted to applaud um, at, at a Mass, when he said, uh, he opened by saying, for God so loved the world that he did not send a committee. Um, <laughs> what I guess I get, I'm getting to is that the planning process didn't necessarily allow and it's kind of inherent in you know, the fact that it's committee driven and there's a finite amount of time, but didn't really allow for the level of detail that's needed. So the plan, uh, it talked about transfer of employees uh, from the village over to the town. It talked about the continuation of services and the, and the level of the, of that services were going to be given. It talked about transfer of assets about the transfer of the debt service, uh, establishments of districts, uh, the codes, the state statute it was very specific about um, how long the village codes would stay in place unless addressed by the plan, and then the establishment of a town-wide police department. Which was probably the, the toughest, the most complex um, and difficult, um, and yes, as Dr. Sinclair uh, already alluded to, an extremely emotional discussion. Um, people really came out in droves to um, offer um, their testament to um, how valuable police services were in the, com in the community. Um, so let's just kind of actually focus on, um, on that as an example. Um, 
what the plan outlined for proposed police services included that, uh, first and foremost, the services would diminish slightly because the town, uh, because the village police department would, uh, without changing uh, uh, policy focus uh, 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 numbers in terms of uh, employees, um, the uh, equipment, uh, without changing anything, um, they would expand the geography and essentially patrol the entire town. So there was an acknowledgement that services would diminish slightly, um, that current employees would be given preferential treatment in terms of hiring, uh, that civil service provisions would apply in that process. Um, the anticipated financial impacts <coughs> were outlined, um, that uh, finite cost, uh, you know, based on the previous year's budget, would be spread out over uh, a tax base that was twice as large, so there would be a reduction in the cost uh, per um, taxpayer, because all costs would transfer to the town. And then lastly, that the town board did not support the plan that was pointed out in the plan. That's it. What you see there was essentially what the plan outlined. And the sum total of actual focus in the, uh, how many pages was the, was the plan all together? Um, counting the budget crosswalk, I think it was 88. 88 pages? Six paragraphs. Six paragraphs to the most controversial topic. Um, that's not really a criticism of the plan as much as, again, the process and to what degree that planning process could get into details. Um, let Connie tell you a little bit about what the plan did not address, and this really is our topic this evening, the transition issues that we faced. So we started out, and of course, the village of Seneca Falls was unionized, the town was not. So right off the bat, we had the union versus the non-union. The impact negotiations, um, we had to be very careful and be concerned about liability to the village to make sure uh, that the employees, um, there was a question as to what they were entitled to from the current municipal, plus what, what, what they were going to get from the town. The town literally owed them nothing. They were going to be made job offers, but not being unionized, it was what it was. We were forced to go into impact negotiations, which were never addressed in the plan, because for many, many years, as all of you that have ever been involved with contract negotiations, each side comes to the table. We came to the table and we, uh, part of our advantage and part of what we were giving to them was um, that they would have a retirement, they would have health insurance benefits post-retirement, they would have all of the um, benefits of that. And then when the village was going to dissolve, suddenly, the town literally owed them nothing. So we had to sit at the table, um, negotiate. None of that was in the, um, the plan as it was stated. The seniority issue, the longevity issues, the sick leave, the vacation, loser entitlement. Um, so many of the people, you know, many of our village employees started at 18 years old. At 48, they have 30 years with an anticipation that when they retire, they would have post retirement health benefits, or they would be entitled to X number of hours being paid for sick leave, or whatever it was. So going over to the town, they were going to be forced to start day one, the next January 1, and it was, uh, it was something that we had to really <coughs> consider and not only worry about what was right, but more importantly, the liability issue. The 41J, if you're not familiar with that, there's um, Within New York State retirement, municipalities can pay a certain percent of their retirement cost every year. And it's a benefit that the employees can then continue to bank, if you will, the sick leave that they're accruing. And after they retire, they can take that and put it towards the seniority and have extra months. Well, many of the employees took that to the bank. That was the sick leave that they were building up when they were going to go over January 1 that was going to be gone. That was never addressed and it had to be worked out with the, with the union 
on both issues. The post-retirement benefits, um, the sick leave was huge. The health benefits was just huge to people. Um, as you know, I mean, you know what health insurance costs today. And then something even as simple as the personnel folders. This, the town wanted them all prior to the dissolution to go through all of them when they were going to interview them. The unions and the employees said they didn't want them turned over. They were not employees at that point. So it was, it was an issue we called. We ended up having to have our attorneys make a determination on whether we could or couldn't. And incidentally, they were not allowed to see them prior to January 1 of the next year. Um, and we had to resolve all of these without the state's help. And that, it, again, isn't a criticism of them. They, they never dealt with it. We would call a simple issue like unemployment insurance. Um, a lot of our people were very concerned. If we don't get picked up, who pays our unemployment? Because in a municipality, it isn't self-insurance. You pay. And um, we called the Department of Labor, and the first thing they said was, well, you pay. No, there is no you. We're going to be gone. Well, the town would pay. Well, the town has already said that's not their responsibility. Not their employees. Right. Yeah. So it was, well, that's a wonderful question. Never heard another one. <laughs> and it was topic after topic um, on the labor side and as we go through the financial. And they didn't know the answer. They had never come up against it. So we were left to resolve them because obviously they had to be resolved as you're closing the village. And everyone was just um, um, gut-wrenching as we went through that. Um, financial issues, the same thing. Employee buyouts, when people started work, employees started work at, at our village, and I know it's very similar across the state, the first year they would accrue vacation, but they couldn't take it. So come the next January 1, they get the vacation from the year before. So you can imagine 30 years of service, many of them. The December 31st, we were dissolving. January 1, they are entitled to all of the benefits from the year before. We had to put that into our shortened last year and have the taxpayers pay that amount, and it was $286,000 for a village our size. And, um, and again, never addressed, never put in for any of the budgets or you know what was staying, what was the cost of dissolving. Nobody thought of it at that time. Um, shortened budget year, you know, we would, we called the state and said, you know, we got our New York State retirement bill. Called them and said, this is a 12-month bill. Um, would you send us a new bill because we're only going to be here seven months? Well, we can't do that. Well, we can't pay a 12-month bill. Wait, you have to. No, we're not going to be there. We'll get back to you. Never got back to us, and we did the 7-12 deal and paid what we thought was fair because we were only there seven months. Capital reserves. You know, there's a, we had capital reserves for many of the functions. Um, never addressed in the plan. Weren't quite sure how to handle them. A lot of our board and residents wanted them drawn down, put back into the fund from where they came, and then used for debt service. Um, really had no legal, weren't quite sure. Again, had to pay legal fees to find out and we get a determination. Um, we talked about the unemployment. What should current village residents pay for versus what should roll over to the town? You know, question after question. The grant wall grows. We had ongoing grants, weren't sure, you know, what do we do with them? All of a sudden, you know how long grants take to finalize. Um, we had to go back through to each one, have the state take over with a new title page, and have the town of Santa Claus do it. Um, the state aid, we called on the CHIPS. CHIPS is the consolidated highway. We weren't sure if it was based on 12 months or miles. So we called and we said, we, you know, we don't know what to put in our budget for the revenue lit last year. Do we take 7 twelfths of it, or is it in fact based on miles? That's a wonderful question. <coughs> we'll get back to you. You've heard Connie talk about you know, actuarials, about um, 
you know, all the expenses associated with the audits and, and the, that we did have done, the attorney fees, the employee buyouts. We took a lot of criticism, especially um, on uh, the, the matter of the employee buyouts, and had to carefully explain it wasn't a matter of making sure that the employees had uh, a great package going out the door. That, that wasn't it at all. We wanted to make sure that uh, when, um, for years and years in contract negotiations, for example, uh, these benefits were expected, and they, they had a reasonable right to expect these benefits, and a legal right to expect these benefits, and then suddenly the benefits disappear. Is there a liability that's left for the village residents? And, oh, by the way, we found out during this period of time that there was going to be a debt district that was going to be left behind that the village response, uh, village, uh, former village residents would be responsible um, to, uh, you know, to, to make annual uh, uh, payments, if you will, for any outstanding liabilities. We wanted to make sure that there were as few uh, potential liabilities or you know, eliminate as many as we could possibly eliminate. And any rights that were uh, um, you know, denied to employees, well, that's, that's a potential liability. So we, we were trying to tie up every uh, loose end, every financial uh, obligation, every <coughs> loose end that we could possibly tie up during that period of time. Um, and those are all hidden costs. You know, Connie mentioned it was uh, uh, you know, what, what, close to a quarter of a million dollars in just the uh, the buyouts uh, for uh, you know for those employees, um, and then of course the intangibles. And Dr. Sinclair already mentioned this. Uh, in our community, neighbor pitted against neighbor, um, it, the, just the emotional nature of the discussion. And to this day, there are certain people who still won't talk to other people. And that's a really unfortunate thing. We're a very close knit community, and uh, you know the the. Traditions are, um, you know, are strong, and uh, and it really is unfortunate to see, um, you know, that kind of devastation being wrought. So those are those are all things to be considered. And then ultimately, after all the dust settles, I mean, we've we've talked to you a lot about the um, the responsibilities, the tasks, if you will, that the village took on. We're only talking about the village's end of things. After all the dust settles, who's left holding the bag and who has to literally um, pick up and, and, and learn how to provide all the services, um, pick up all the expense for the services? Who's left holding the bag? It's the town board who now suddenly is responsible for a whole host of, uh, of things that they've never been responsible for before. So um, it, it really is um, a tremendously complex and burdensome issue. Um, the village of Seneca Falls dissolved on December 31st, 2011. Our staff walked out the door about 11 o'clock New Year's Eve, um, true. locked the doors, and uh, as far as the fiscal impact, the jury's still out on the dissolution. It really takes some time, at least at one full year, to be able to look at the financials and to see um, just where we are and, uh, and uh, possibly do an analysis against the plan. But at this point, you know, you can do all the analysis you want. It, it's a done deal and uh, it is what it is. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the critical parts of the discussion, um, the plan did really um, attempt to address um, what services are going to continue? Um, at what level will the services continue, if they're going to continue? And then what are the financial impacts? Those are all, you know, those critical questions. But Dr. Sinclair already uh, hit, I think, what is the most um, important um, piece of information that everyone understands, you know, entering into this discussion, that it is completely, entirely up to the town board to determine how much of a plan will actually be followed. They're not bound to it. And um, in, in our case, um, you know, there's a tremendous amount that, um, that differs. There's a tremendous uh, uh, number of issues that the plan addressed that the town board chose not to, to follow. So uh, to follow the recommendations of the plan. So, um, uh, you know, again, I, I just think that's really central to the discussion.
So we, we certainly appreciate being able to um, participate. We, we thank Mayor Millar and Joanne um, from Binghamton University for creating this forum. Um, we certainly feel that if we can help other communities avoid some of the problems that we faced in Sunny Falls, then um, um, that means that perhaps something good can come out of our experience. So um, thank you for the chance to, to share that. Dr. Hattery? Hello. I plan to go a long time now. Just kidding. Um, and we've been talking about consolidation and dissolution largely. And I'm going to talk a little bit for a few minutes about, from a citizen's perspective, uh, some, some ways in which consolidation and dissolution may be a meat axe when a scalpel is needed. Um, and let me start out by asking this. I think as a citizen, oftentimes you may, we may have concern, something that's bothering us about a government that serves us. And um, we may have even taken some steps to engage. And I think it's really important that we say, what's my problem or concern, and what's the best strategy to address it? Um, I've met with different communities over the years, and I mean, the number one is, I probably could ask you to say this, and you'd say it in unison, and that is, taxes are too high, and we can't afford it. Um, and again, I'm going to ask you, I'm not going to repeat this mantra, but that isn't necessarily going to be addressed by consolidation or dissolution. Okay? Um, another one that often is heard is the town, in, this, in the case of a village like this, the town, or the town and the village together can provide this service more efficiently than the way it's currently being provided. And I'm not going to repeat the mantra, but it isn't necessarily the best approach to think of consolidation and dissolution. Something in my government needs to change. I, I met with a group late one night over by the Hudson River, a group of citizens that were upset. And one of the big concerns that was shared by a number of them is the village had a treasurer that was just making three to four times what a typical treasurer's salary in the rest of the county. And they were proposing to dissolve the village <laughs> as a way of addressing that problem. Again, I, sometimes we need a scalpel instead of a meat axe. And then, you know, I think sometimes it's daunting as a citizen to say, how are we going to change that? But as um, uh, folks from Seneca Falls have described, there's a lot of bigger problems when you get into looking at dissolution and or consolidation. Um, another one that I think drives a lot of people's thinking, even though it may be underneath the tax taxes are too high, and that is we need economic development that provides more job opportunities and better job opportunities. And the need acts is to get rid of the local government as opposed to saying, how can we uh, do other things to help address our tax burden to um, uh, address that underlying theme of we'd like to see some different kinds of development and new jobs come to the area. The one that I think definitely happens in some places, and that is that village government's no longer needed. Um, there's no core purpose that's different. Our services are the same as the town outside us. Um, we're having trouble finding enough people to run for office. Um, you know, there's a whole range of things that say we're really not that much different than the, than the government around us. And I think that's the one in this list that I would say, you know, that's when consolidation or dissolution is really uh, a strong uh, solution to be looked at in the mix. Um, <clears throat> now let me advocate a little bit for one other alternative that we haven't talked about tonight that is done a lot all over the place, and that is why consider why not consider service sharing or service by contract as an alternative to eliminating a unity government? Let me say why that's a good option. It has broad-based legal authority in New York. Um, under Article 5G of the General Municipal Law, anything that two governments can do individually, they can do together. Um, so there's, there's a broad-based authority for governments to work together to provide a particular service or activity. Um, follow the dollars. It's where the bulk of savings are. Um, 90 to 95% of the cost of local government 
are items that can be addressed either through service consolidation or administrative sharing. Three, there's more practical examples. I think they, were, they mentioned earlier that Seneca Falls is the largest uh, village dissolution at least in 25 or 30 years. I can't remember if Tyler was close to you in population, or Ticonderoga. Um, but there aren't that many to draw from. Whereas um, when we look at uh, shared services and contracts for services, there are examples all over the place. In most instances, your local government is currently in some kind of any uh, uh, multiple shared service arrangements now that can be borrowed on to look at other ones to address services that can be provided more efficiently and jointly. So <laughs> there's a lot of legal authority. Um, that's where the dollars are. Um, there's a lot more practical examples that can be drawn from um, that don't have all of the uncovered precedents that were just discussed in this presentation. And fourthly, a shared services by contract arrangement to, to get efficiencies in local government is a change you can recover from. Um, trying to reconstitute a village once it's dissolved or consolidated is, I would say, nigh on impossible. If you enter into a shared service agreement to achieve that any available savings, it can always retrench from that if it doesn't work out. It's much easier to retrench from that. Inclusion and uh, kind of wrapping up, I think for a lot of people the question is which way should we go? I mean, uh, service sharing, contracting, dissolution. Um, uh, we, people have talked a lot about the barriers. I uh, love Tom and, and uh, Diane and Connie talked about some of the, the real problems with both dissolution and consolidation. And I would point you back to asking the question, um, what is the problem that we perceive? What's the problem we're trying to address? <clears throat> and if you conclude, uh, I would put in this pitch, if you conclude that one government has to go, either because uh, for, for whatever perceived condition in the community you've consumed, um, I've got to argue, I, I used to uh, go around and, and give uh, short talks about uh, the need for a consolidation law as opposed to a dissolution law before uh, the law that Tom summarized was, was passed recently. And it seems to me that um, consolidation is always a better strategy to dissolution when there is anything in the former village area that citizens want to have some measure of certainty to protect or continue. If there's anything there you want to have certainty to protect or continue, consolidation will provide a venue for you to work that out with a government you're going to join with. Whereas dissolution basically, um, uh, Connie and and uh, Diane described things that the current town government that they dissolved into is retrenching from things that were in their dissolution plan. So if there are things that you really want to guarantee for the future, consolidation may give you the opportunity to do that in, in creating one government rather than two. Um, I was trying to make this point um, a number of years ago and uh, a businessman in the group that I was talking to said, I get the picture. He said, dissolution is a funeral because the government's dying. And consolidation is like a wedding. You're taking two, go two governments or two people and creating one new one. And we celebrate weddings. And we agonize through and have to feel a lot of pain in, in families. So thank you for uh, giving me your time. And uh, this were yeah. questions now, Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Bob. Question for our guests from Seneca Falls. What was the, what prompted the move to dissolve the village of Seneca Falls? Who are we? I'll let you start it. How's that? Um, in the village of Seneca Falls, we're fairly unique. Of course, every village in the world thinks they're unique. But um, the town of, within the town of Seneca Falls, there is the largest landfill in New York State. Uh, that generates a, in the Northeast that generates a tremendous amount of revenue on a yearly basis that the town of Seneca Falls um, would get it based on um, percent of revenues and it equated to typically maybe three, $3 million dollars a year. 
So that went to the town. Uh, they um, felt whatever the board was at that time, it's funny because all of the board members were village residents, but the town, they, board. The town board were village <coughs> residents, but they felt that um, they could not share that revenue. Um, I do believe that- Or um, spend it on infrastructure. Or spend it on infrastructure, which would be the sharing. We certainly didn't want them to write a check, but it would have been nice to say benefiting, you know, um, our police department, certainly protected the schools, the town residents had children in the schools, protected our downtown, our parks, kept their property values up with that protection and the quality of life. Uh, but yet, a few feet outside of that village line, the town uh, paid absolutely no dollars at all for police protection. Well, they paid no town tax either. Right. So the, the sense that there was disparity uh, was tremendous. People inside the village paid a high rate of tax. No, I won't, I mean, I, that's a safe statement because I, I've never met anybody yet who said their taxes were too low. Um, but, the, you know, but inside the village, a high tax rate, all those services were being funded by those residents. People, uh, you step over the line, as Connie said, and the tax rate outside the village, the town tax rate was zero because of that landfill re revenue. It generated about $3 million a year. So, you know, the, the sense of, uh, you know, uh, inequity. Tremendous. And people felt how okay, how can how can we share in what they felt truly that they were town residents as well. Um, we had a shared services study done, but you know yeah, we actually initiated that in the hopes that there would be um, um, an argument built to um, you know let's let's get together, let's use the landfill revenue, let's 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 actually underwrite infrastructure, let's share you know these expenses, and it immediately turned into a dissolution and yeah, yeah. no brainer. You know, as they said, and then, and then, as we said earlier, the train left the station. They recommended dissolution, at least to look at it. You know, it was always study it, take a look at it. And uh, once that um, study started and it came to a vote, when they were touting, you know, 40%, 50% savings, because on their side, they could use all of that revenue to supplement the budget, and certainly there was going to be a tax savings. We were like the poor stepsister. You know, we didn't have that kind of money. So that situation created the climate. Um, in my opinion, the accelerant was <laughs> um, uh, uh, political. Uh, the, uh, uh, an individual who ran for for an office for the, for the, uh, the mayor's position who lost the election um, started started the petition process immediately afterwards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good question. Okay. Uh, what percentage of the property in Seneca Falls was not taxable? Uh, you know, five one two threes of churches and that kind of thing. We were just talking about this because we we've, we've been actually uh, talking to a community that has a an extremely high percentage um, <coughs> because of the presence of two universities in that in that uh, uh, community. And literally, they have a, a 73 percent, uh, uh, you know, uh, untaxed uh, amount of untaxed property. We're, we're blown away by that. Um, but we talked in the car about the fact that I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we have several not-for-profits in the community, but we had never actually uh, sat down and, and calculated how much. Which low, I would, I would venture by to comparison. say, low compared to anybody with a county seat. You know, anybody if there, there is is going to be much higher than ours was. Yeah, you must be uh, tremendously impacted here with being the county seat. Lyons, by the same token, and Wayne County is the county seat, and their rate is about 38 percent. So um, that, that's tough. That's a tough challenge. Yeah. Just a comment and question. Uh, very much agree with Diana on your opening statement about local government and the gentleman on the end of the shared services. It's a much better approach. But I know that. Um, if I remember correctly, because I saw you at Association of Towns last year, um, the population of the village was much heavier than the town. And, uh, and here, in our town, it's flipped. I was wondering if that would have an impact, if you think that would have an impact on uh, what it would be there. You know, it's funny because while we were 73% of the town, when, when you look at the actual tax base, it's almost equal. It's almost 50 50. Because the, 50 /50. the properties outside of the village um, are uh, assessed higher. 
And so it ended up being, um, they were 54% in the tax base. So what that did, obviously, even though there were many more people in the village, is that instead of a cost savings, it, it truly was a cost shift. You have almost twice as much tax base to spread those costs out. Get there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Right at the beginning, you said that the town was not in favor of this. Uh, do you think that the ride that you experienced would have been less rocky if the town had been more cooperative? And the reason I ask that question is that I think human nature is such as it is that towns often uh, want to develop their own little fightings and, uh, and, and then stonewall any, any attempt to change the status quo. That's an opinion, but in answer to your question, would it have been easier if the town had been cooperative? Um, when we first put together our study committee, um, followed the statute, you know, had to have uh, uh, two members from the, the, you know, the town. Um, um, we established a nine-member committee. We asked the town supervisor to um, to participate. Um, there was some concern that um, that no elected officials be actually part of the committee or be voting members of the committee. Uh, so Connie and I participated as informational resource, um, and but the town supervisor participated. And, you know, we we pretty much insisted on it because we sort of recognized going into it that the town board was going to be um, a, a major player. I think we didn't realize until uh, you know things were coming to their conclusion that um, um, in some regards the town board is the only player. Um, but, um, but yeah, the town supervisor was very um, um, actively uh, uh, participating in the decision making um, throughout the whole um, process with the committee. So I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that there was a, um, a reluctance to, you know, to embrace any of the, the concepts that were being discussed, but he's, he was one of five people. Um, he did, um, very quickly uh, become pro-dissolution and promote it uh, in his communication, uh, even in town newsletters, um, and uh, ultimately uh, was not re-elected last November, uh, not this past election, but the prior, right before dissolution well, was implemented, was, uh, it became effective on uh, January 1st, and the November election uh, was not re-elected. Keep in mind that you know, while 73 percent of the population in, in the village might have been extremely excited about the reduction in their tax rate, 27 20, percent of the town's population outside the village was really angry at the increase in their in, in really their expenses. Angry. Yeah, from really zero angry. to a lot of money. Yeah, and nothing drives people to um, you know become politically active, um, you know, uh, like uh, like feeling like the, they've been wronged. Other questions? Yes, Diana, Connie, recognizing that Connie, you said until you go one year into this, you're not going to be able to see what the, the, the dollar the fiscal uh, impact on it is. And both of you would uh, reference the animosity that developed between neighbors, friends, and so on like that. My question would be, um, about that one year evaluation, has the animosity somewhat leveled itself off a little bit? And if so, does your former constituents and father, if they would go down this pathway again, if they had the choice? I will um, preface what I'm going to say with the realization with, by, by saying that I realize that when I talk to people, they're likely to tell me what I want to hear. Um, I realize that. Um, so to answer your question, I'll say most of the people that I talk to now say that, that they have regrets. And they would have, um, um, you know, some people tell me, oh, they, they, would have, they would have voted. They didn't go there. They were so, they were so sure that it was going to fail. They didn't, they didn't vote. There are others who have communicated to us that they were very confused by the language of the ballot. There were signs up in the community that said, vote yes, save the village, implying that if you voted yes to dissolve the village, you would be saving the village. 
So, especially among senior citizens, there was tremendous confusion about, you know, what voting yes versus voting no meant. And uh, so, uh, you know, to answer your question, we, we, we get a lot of messages from people about, uh, that, that express some sort of regret or, or a misunderstanding, and if they had it to do over again, no, they, you know, it, it, they, they believe it wouldn't have passed. But I'll, I'll acknowledge that I'm sure that the people who don't feel that way aren't talking to me, so, so I'm not that hearing it. Taxes, former village residents, their taxes are much lower because the town used to take a great deal of that revenue and put it into a tax stabilization fund for when there's no landfill. The, last, the first year of the dissolution and this year, they have taken that entire amount to supplement their income, their budget. So the taxes are still lower in the inside the village. And you know, without really understanding all the implications and what's going to happen when the landfill's not there or what's going to happen because they're hiring more policemen, they're buying more trucks, they're, they're, yeah, um, they're adding, administrative, adding help. administrative help. They're doing all of that, but they're not feeling the crunch because that $3 million is still being put in there to supplement um, the budget. So you do have people that say, gee, our taxes are still down. I will tell you, as of January 1, of the first, last January 1, the first day, the water rates went up and the sewer rates went up. The sewer rates especially 268%. And of course it was entirely our fault. <laughs> it was entirely our fault. But in reality, um, there had been some renegotiation with the land. They had added extra uh, wastewater treatment plant operators because the men in the plant said they needed them. Um, and just on and on and on. Well, let me just let me just interject. Um, that's a that topic is a perfect example of how, in our case, um, this is all supposed to be done in the name of efficiency. One of the cost drivers in terms of water and sewer rates, um, the village was able to um, utilize um, management um, across three funds. Um, a you know, single individual who was um, a public works superintendent um, with careful fund accounting, um, that individual could, their, their, their salary came from the general fund because they managed the street group, but also came from the water fund and from the sewer fund because they managed the water maintainers. They, you know, they were ultimately in charge of the, of, of the sewer department as well. So as a director of public works, one person was the, more the hat for all three and with careful fund accounting, you know, uh, that meant that water customers only paid a third of his salary, sewer customers only paid a third of his salary, and taxes only supported a third of his salary. Uh, I'm generalizing, but that's pretty much what the split was. Very close. And um, post-dissolution, <laughs> there's a highway superintendent, there's a elected, there's a, you know, person in charge of water, and there's a person in charge of sewer. So in the name of efficiency, um, dissolution created you know, why have one person in management when you can have three? Well, so, our village is ahead of time. Pardon me? Our village is ahead of time, and we do that already. <laughs> but, but, you know, that, that's one of my personal frustrations, and, and I think um, Dr. Gary, you know, put it, put it beautifully. Um, you know, that, again, I think um, intuitively people want to say there's an economy of scale or that there's, you know, there are savings to be achieved. Um, and I, I, I can't wait until the end of this year when we can actually look at, um, uh, you know, the, the, the record of expenditures and understand what happened to the cost of government services in Senator Falls. That'll be the, to me, that'll be the real, um, you know, uh, that's the bottom line. It's, you know, the, you can't, you can't expect John Q. Public to, um, you know, to um, um, to quibble about whether or not there were savings because they saw their tax bill go down. But the, the bottom line is, what are the cost of government services? And, and we won't know that until the end of this year.